Welcome back scholars to another e-learning lesson video. This is another Q2 enrichment video. This one over explaining the intended effects of a rhetorical strategy uh, on an audience. So when you examine a rhetorical strategy or rhetorical choice, whatever the language of the prompt uh, asks you about, uh, really you're trying to do four things. You must examine uh, the what, meaning what techniques or devices does the writer employ? The where, meaning where in the text do they employ them? That's where you provide your text evidence. The how, meaning how is this intended to affect the audience? Uh, meaning how is the uh, uh, technique or device intended to affect the audience? And finally, the why. Why does the writer attempt to affect the audience in this way? Meaning what rhetorical constraints were they addressing uh, when they made this particular choice? The what and the where are both identification tasks, uh, meaning you're just picking out things, identifying things that are uh, explicitly uh, given in the text. That means that uh, they're much easier to do. Uh, your lower scoring essays, the essays that score three and below, will tend to focus on this because it's an easier task and because they're only doing the easier task, they'll, they'll score low. The how and the why are interpretation tasks, and this is a much more difficult thing to do uh, because they require a great deal of critical thinking, not just picking out things you're explicitly given, but figuring out what that stuff means. Uh, higher scoring essays will have varying levels of success depending on uh, how well they're able to deal with these interpretation tasks. So being able to explain the how, which is the intended effects of a rhetorical strategy on the audience, uh, is perhaps the most important skill you can develop in rhetorical analysis and particularly on the, Q2, the AP Lang Q2. Uh, after all, rhetorical analysis is examining how a writer achieves a persuasive purpose. And unless you can explain the specific function of a particular technique or a particular device in the context in which it's used, if you can't do that, you can't actually perform rhetorical analysis. All you're doing is naming a bunch of devices that you, that you see and showing me that they're there. Well, that's not rhetorical analysis. I don't really know what that so how do I go about explaining the intended effects of a rhetorical technique or device on an audience? So to answer this question, there's really two big principles to keep in mind. Um, when used purposefully, every technique or device that a writer employs in a persuasive text will always, uh, one, affect the audience through one or more of the three means of persuasion, and two, further their overall purpose in some way. So how do techniques and devices affect the audience through the three means of persuasion? Well, Aristotle wrote back in the third century BCE that persuasion is achieved through three different means, through the character of the writer, through the reasonability of the text, and through the disposition or emotional state of the audience. Today, we often call these the three rhetorical appeals. Uh, ethos, which is the persuasion through the character of the writer. Logos, which is persuasion through the reasonability of the text. And finally, pathos, which is persuasion through the emotional state of the audience. Every technique or device that you come across, every one that you include in your analysis, uh, will affect the audience in one or more of these ways or it will enhance the effects of another technique or device's uh, means of persuasion. So let's start off with the first uh, of the three means there. How do techniques and devices affect the audience through the character of the writer? Well, writers will commonly attempt within their persuasive text to create a persona. Uh, persona is just a, a, like a mask that they would wear, a character that they play for that particular text, apart from who they are in real life. Uh, and persona is defined by any number of characteristics that the writer attempts to demonstrate throughout the text. 
You see, certain audiences are going to be inclined to agree with certain kinds of people. So writers will try to uh, demonstrate that they are those kinds of people and demonstrate specific kind of characteristics. Now, what characteristics are appropriate? Well, that's highly dependent on each rhetorical situation as different kind of audiences, different under different contexts, uh, under different subject matters will require a different kind of persona. So some common characteristics, though, that audiences just generally find uh, persuasive uh, include things like intelligence or virtue or being goodwilled, which just means being selfless and having uh, others' interests in mind instead of just your own. Being affable, being like-minded or relatable sometimes being authoritative as well. Uh, you want to be careful here, though, while generally audiences find these characteristics persuasive in a writer, um, they are dependent on situation. For instance, uh, authoritative is a characteristic that some audiences would find uh, pleasing and agreeable, and it would actually help the writer uh, accomplish their purpose. However, in other instances, appearing authoritative might actually hurt the writer's purpose. Again, it all depends on the situation. When you write about a technique or device that persuades through ethos or the character of the writer, you want to make sure that you identify specific characteristics, give specific adjectives that the writer is demonstrating to their audience. You want to make sure that you explain how those particular characteristics come through uh, and are demonstrated through whatever the text evidence is that you provide. Lastly, you got to make sure that you explain how demonstrating those characteristics is helping the writer further their overall purpose in some way. To illustrate this, let's take a look at a released uh, Q2 prompt. This is from the 2014 exam. This is Abigail Adams's letter to her son from 1780. Now, in this letter that a lot of you are familiar with, uh, Adam, Abigail Adams uh, begins the letter by attempting to present herself as a caring mother. She starts off the letter by uh, hoping that her son is safe and sending her well wishes. So if we were going to write about the ethos effects of this, about the how this is um, affecting the audience by, may, by presenting the writer as having certain characteristics, we might say something like this. By beginning her letter with well wishes and expressions of hope for his safety, Adams implies that her son's well-being is her primary concern. Sharing these concerns helps Adam appear caring, which is intended to soften her audience's heart and make him more receptive to her advice in the letter. Okay, so there I've explained uh, what she does, how she appears with a specific adjective, caring, uh, and I've uh, explained its, uh, what it's intended to do as part of the larger purpose, which is to soften him to her, so, you know, like uh, uh, make him more receptive to hearing her advice. So let's look at the next way that an audience can be affected. How did te techniques and devices affect the audience through the reasonability of the text? Well, perhaps the most common tool of persuasion is the argument, right? Uh, arguments come in many forms, but they all persuade in the same way. They all attempt to make a particular idea seem reasonable to the audience. So reason is the universal. What's reasonable to one person is, in theory, reasonable to everybody. Uh, however, different lines of reasoning are, are appropriate depending on uh, each rhetorical situation. That is, what might uh, be an appropriate line of reasoning to use on one particular audience in one particular time and place might not be appropriate to a different audience in a different time and place. And that just has to do with different uh, things like cultural values, different what, what audiences want, that sort of thing. The reasoning in a persuasive text is often designed to do uh, a few things. One, it can help an audience understand something that they may not be familiar with. It can also be designed to enlighten an audience about something completely new to them or teach them. It can be used to correct a misconception that the audience may have or flat out rebut an opposing argument that the audience might believe is valid. These are all different uh, things that you need to be looking for when you explain the intended effect of using uh, reasoning or building logos 
So when you write about a technique or device that persuades through reason, that persuades through logos, you always have to make sure that you paraphrase the reasoning being used. You want to paraphrase the claim and evidence, explain what the reasoning is supposed to make the audience think. Is it helping them learn something new, helping them realize something difficult? Is it helping correct some belief, that sort of thing? And then explain how that particular line of reasoning helps the writer further their overall purpose. Let's take a look at another example. In that same uh, passage that we looked at, the Abigail Adams letter, uh, this is a, a pretty commonly written about technique that she uses. She uses a couple of metaphors. Uh, she uses a metaphor that compares a traveler to a river that strengthens the further it flows, how the current of a river and indeed how wide and strong that river is, the further it flows from its source toward the ocean, it gets wider and stronger as it goes. She uses another metaphor that also compares a traveler to a spring which improves the taste of its water as that water passes through various minerals before finally reaching the surface. So if I were going to write about the effects of this particular uh, logos technique I might say something like this. Through these metaphors Adams argues that travel both sharpens and broadens the mind because it forces the individual to expand their knowledge of the world and absorb new and different experiences. The argument is intended to teach her son about the intellectual benefits of the voyage he is on, and the use of concrete images to illustrate abstract ideas helps a young mind better grasp this wisdom. So I made sure in that first sentence there to paraphrase the uh, claim and evidence there, the actual argument, uh, because in a metaphor it's not plainly stated. Uh, and then I talk about the specific intended effect, how in this case it's intended to teach her son. Uh, and this is a, a good technique for a young person uh, because it's, it's illustrative in nature. All right, moving on to the last means of uh, last of the three means of persuasion. How do techniques and devices affect the audience through their emotional states? Yeah, writers, as you guys have seen, will frequently attempt to stir specific emotions in the audience. Uh, and that's because our decision making as human beings, uh, our decision making is just closely tied into the emotional state that we're in. Certain ideas are just more agreeable to people when they're in a certain frame of mind. Uh, keep in mind, though, the most appropriate emotion that a writer can use is dependent on each individual rhetorical situation. That is uh, an emotion that might be appropriate to argue one idea in one situation may not be appropriate given a different argument in a different situation. So common emotions that a writer will often seek to stir in an audience, there's a lot of them, uh, but some of the most common ones include things like anger, calm, fear and its opposite confidence, friendliness and its opposite enmity, kindness and unkindness, shame and shamelessness, and that's just a short list. I'm going to go ahead and link to the full list that I gave out to you guys uh, way back in December. I'll link to that in the description to this video. When you write about a technique or device that persuades through stirring emotions or pathos, uh, you always have to identify the specific emotion. You have to, have to, have to, have to do this. If you just say that the uh, writer appeals to emotions, you're not saying anything at all. You have to identify what that specific emotion is. Next, don't forget to identify the object of the emotion, meaning to whom or to what that emotion is being directed. Don't just say that the writer's trying to stir anger in the audience. Uh, anger at what? Anger at whom? Okay, be very specific with the object of that emotion. You also need to explain how those particular emotions are demonstrated through whatever text evidence you provide. And then finally, explain how stirring those emotions helps the writer further their overall purpose. All right, let's take a look at an example about how we might write about the pathos effects of a particular technique. Uh, some of you noted in your analyses of the Abigail Adams letter that she attempts to stir confidence in her son by citing uh, his various abilities and the advantages he's been given uh, in life. So if we're going to write about this, the write, write about the effect rather, we might say something like this. By reminding him of his talents and of the support network around him, Adams is attempting to inspire confidence in her son 
confidence in his ability to face whatever difficulties the voyage throws at him. He can speak French, he has his father to teach him, and he is intellectually gifted, all things that a young boy needs to cope with the uncertainty of traveling to a foreign place and to deal with the heavy burdens of his diplomatic mission or that his diplomatic mission has placed on him. So here I've explained, or first of all, I've identified the specific emotion of confidence. I've identified the target of that emotion, uh, confidence uh, in his abilities to face these uh, fears and difficulties of what's ahead. Uh, I've elaborated specifically from the text evidence, the specific things that are uh, confidence inspiring. And finally, just talked about how it's helping her achieve her overall goal of kind of encouraging him to, um, to view the voyage as a great character building uh, or growth uh, exercise, that sort of thing, uh, by saying that uh, it's helping him to cope with the difficulties ahead. Note that single techniques and devices can actually have multiple intended effects on an audience. Uh, for instance, a number of you talked about the indirect comparison that Abigail Adams draws between her son and Cicero. And this actually has a, a couple of different uh, effects. Uh, it has a logos effect that in that uh, it's intended to teach her son or help continue teaching her son the uh, value of facing difficulties. Uh, the comparison to Cicero specifically trying to teach him the value as a uh, in its character building, that sort of thing. Uh, but at the same time, this uh, indirect comparison is also intended to flatter her son, thereby stirring what Aristotle would call friendship toward her. I know that's kind of a weird term to talk about friendship between a mother and son, but that's the, the, best, uh, the best adjective I've come up with here. Be careful, though, that you don't accidentally attribute effects of a technique that aren't really there. Uh, some students will take things too far by saying that that technique there above, uh, the comparison to Cicero, also helps stir patriotism in her son. Yeah, I read this in a couple of essays saying that uh, since Cicero was a great patriot of Rome, it makes her son feel patriotic. Well, that's a real logical stretch there. The, it's strange to suggest that comparing someone to someone else makes them feel how that person felt. That's kind of weird. Um, Adams does directly appeal to her son's sense of patriotism later in the paragraph, uh, where she argues that her son owes his existence to the American colonists who fought in the revolution. But the comparison to Cicero uh, really doesn't go much further than the two things I outlined there. Uh, you could say that it has some ethos effects that it demonstrates her intelligence. Uh, I think that's better demonstrated elsewhere. Uh, so just be careful that you don't take, take things too far, especially when it's uh, trying to attribute an effect to uh, the wrong technique, like, like, like I had students do here. If they would have just uh, talked about a whole new technique at the end of the paragraph, uh, it would have made a whole lot more sense. Finally, I need to reiterate this. Uh, make sure that you always explain every intended effect as a means of furthering the overall purpose. Uh, you see, all those different devices and techniques that a, a writer employs, they all work together to achieve that overall purpose, whatever it is. Each technique or device, however, is going to work a little bit differently. So you have like the effect of devices and techniques being like different pieces of a larger jigsaw puzzle. They aren't all the the same shape, but put together, they all contribute differently to the whole. So where many students go wrong when talking about the effects on, on audiences, they like to simply state that such and such technique or device helps achieve this overall purpose. And they're not actually explaining specifically how it achieves that overall purpose. It creates this very vague explanation that asks your reader to make this, this giant leap in logic. Uh, it's also an example of unexplained reasoning, which can dramatically reduce your score in row B. So to illustrate what I'm talking about here, let's say that this is the purpose that we identified in that Abigail Adams letter. You could phrase this a bunch of different ways, but here's what I wrote. I said that her purpose is to encourage her son to embrace the voyage with his father as an opportunity for personal growth. So here's an example of some vague and some specific ways of tying in the effects of a particular device or technique to the overall purpose. A vague thing might be if I said this, demonstrating that caring persona helps Adams encourage her son to embrace the voyage with his father as an opportunity for personal growth. You see how I just kind of stated the technique and then said it 
helps with the the overall purpose well as a reader of of this kind of uh, analysis my first question is how exactly how does it do that uh it's because you're asking me to make this great leap in logic uh without filling me in on the steps in between so a more specific way a better way to write that would be something like this demonstrating a caring persona helps soften her audience's feelings toward her and makes him more receptive to her advice in the letter her advice, of course, being that he ought to embrace the voyage with his father as an opportunity for personal growth, so on and so forth. So here I've taken this particular technique and I've explained it, explained how it works specifically as an entity unto itself. Uh, and that particular effect clearly is helping achieve that overall purpose, because if he's not receptive to her advice, then she can't encourage him. Here's another example, I saw this a few times, saying that the two metaphors are intended to encourage her son to embrace the blah blah blah, just saying that the two metaphors help accomplish the purpose. Again, how exactly? I need to take a smaller step to get there. So I might say this, the two metaphors are intended to teach Adams' son about the intellectual benefits of the voyage, which can help him better appreciate the opportunity. That, of course, going on to encourage him to embrace that voyage. All right, to recap, when explaining the effects of a technique or device on an audience, make sure that you discuss ways that it uh, either makes the writer appear to have certain characteristics in the eyes of the audience, helps the audience think differently about something, or stirs specific emotions in the audience, or some combination of those three things. Remember also that single techniques and devices can have multiple effects on the audience. Just be careful you don't attribute too much to a single device or technique. And then lastly, make sure that you explain intended effects in terms of how they work specifically to achieve the overall purpose. Don't just say that they achieve that overall purpose. Uh, show the, the baby steps and reasoning to get there. All right, scholars, that's all I have for you for this video. Another long one, but it's the only one this week. I wanted to do a whole week just devoted to improving your uh, explanation of intended effects because that is such a huge difference uh, between a three, a four, a five, and a six on the essay. Uh, and because I would say probably 60% uh, of you were not doing that at all uh, in that Abigail Adams letter. You just kind of skipped the how altogether. Some of you tried to replace it with some really bizarre explanations of like uh, Abigail Adams's thought process and that sort of thing. We don't care about that. Just explain the effects on the audience. Uh, and if you're struggling to come up with that, just think back to ethos, logos, pathos. It's probably going to be explaining in one or more of those ways or enhancing another technique that does, exp uh, that does uh, affect the audience in one or more of those ways. All right, that's all I have. Scholars, as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I'll see you when I see you.